episode 41 of Camerata Pacifica's Concerts at Home. My name is Adrian Spence. I'm the artistic director for Camerata Pacifica. And today we have my friend, Billy Short. This is Mr. William Short, the principal bassoon of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. The most sophisticated ensemble in the country, I believe. Is that, is that correct? I, I have no idea what to say to that, Adrian. <laughs> um, well, they, they, they used to say, <laughs> I remember Northern Ireland, growing up in Northern Ireland, that they used to say um, uh, su such was the economic situation there when I was growing up, that they used to say that, that, that the country, the province used to have the most highly educated, unemployed workforce in the world. I think America might be right up there at the moment, right? You're you're not wrong. Certainly, in the in the classical music field, that seems to be the case. So, I mean, I have to ask you. I mean, and, and of course, Mr. Gelb has been uh, Mr. Gelb has been being Mr. Gelb. So I won't ask you to comment on that because that would be like asking you to comment on Mr. Trump being Mr. Trump. But um, did I say that out loud? I did say that out loud. Um, you, what an ordeal. How, what's going on? How, 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 how are you handling it? I mean, the, the Met was one of the first orchestras to, to fully cut. I mean, they, they didn't hang around. They just chopped. No, it's, it's, it's not great. I mean, the, the relationship there has been uh, tenuous between, you know, management and, and labor for as long as I've been been in the orchestra, certainly. And this this current situation just makes things that much more difficult, that much more combative. And you know, I I I, I have to approach this situation with a sense of gratitude you know, for having had the opportunity to be in the job for a while, to build up, you know, teaching opportunities at, at schools around, around the city, um, you know, to, to be in a place that's, uh, that's pretty stable, uh, you know, particularly in comparison to so many of my colleagues, so many of the new people in the orchestra who've been there for a year or two, and then the ground just, just drops out beneath them. Uh, that that you know my my wife and I are are really really grateful um, to be in the position that we're at because we're really the the lucky few. Things are your wife really. Also, your wife's also in the orchestra. My wife my wife is is a hornist, but she's she's not in the orchestra. Uh, she she plays a variety of of different places, but you know it's pretty dire for 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 a lot of people for a lot of my colleagues. Yeah. Uh, and there, there's just no way around that. I'm hoping, I am hoping, I, um, that by the end of this year, we see increasing momentum to come out of this. But it's it's going to be a different landscape on the other side, a different music, a different landscape in every way. Um, I, I think so. And 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 you know, you and I have talked before uh, about you know, for example, how well positioned an organization like Camerata is to sort of adapt to that changing landscape and to trailblaze and to lead the way. I mean, we, we've talked about some of the, you know, innovative, creative ways that, that you've been coming up with to, to engage new audiences. And, you know, that's, that's yet another thing that I'm grateful for is the opportunity to, to branch out and be, be involved in organizations like Camerata that are doing such fantastic things that can be so nimble uh, in, in an environment like this. So, um, when did you when did you come to the map? When, when did you start at the map? I, I started in fall uh, 2012. Uh, I was fresh out of grad school, uh, had absolutely no business occupying the the chair that that I now occupied, and just found myself in the sort of unconscionably fortunate position of having a lot of people around me who were willing to cut me a lot of slack. We're still doing that. <laughs> I'm doing that right at this point. I just, I just want to say it. But... The, 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 the feeling, as always, is mutual. <laughs> um, 
And so, well, let's let's go back. Um, where are you from? And Texas. Okay, once again, you can't that, you can't, you can't tell from the accent. Cut me a bit of slack once again. <laughs> I'm just gonna let that one slide. Um, where are you in Texas? Just north of Austin. And so, do they have bassoons in Texas? They have you you joke, but there's an astonishing culture of music education in in Texas. I mean, it basically comes back to in Texas, high school football is a religion where you have a football team. You have to have a marching band where you have a marching band. You have to have something for them to do in the spring. And and, and so it was actually an incredible place for me to grow up. I mean, I, I played in, you know, Texas Allstate uh, band and orchestra with people who now are in Chicago Symphony, Kansas City Symphony. Washington National Opera, Louisiana Philharmonic, Omaha Symphony. I mean, just all over the place. It's it's amazing. Yeah, all, all teasing aside, but when when you when you hear about the these these youth musical movements, um, and and bands, I started. I, that's how I started playing in Northern Ireland in a band, in a town band. It wasn't a, a high school band, although I did that. Um, so from from Texas and did you get to keep your uniform and does it have a little hat and no and yes good 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 good, good. and and now and now I'm, I'm devastated to say I can't remember what what the what the thingy on top of the hat is called but it's really silly okay um if you can ever provide a photograph I I, I mean I I promise I wouldn't publish it um yeah, no I definitely believe you I absolutely <laughs> believe you so hot word so from texas to texas then then where'd you go from texas uh so so after after i finished high school i um i went to the curtis institute of music in philadelphia uh for my for my undergrad um in my last year there uh i won principal bassoon in the delaware symphony um and actually held that job which was a sort of about one week a month um job uh, simultaneously with with actually returning to Texas and, and doing my master's at Rice University in Houston. And then oh. and then very, very soon after I finished at, at, at Rice, I was I was lucky to win my, my position at the Met. Did you uh, did you know, did you cross paths with Jose at Curtis? We crossed paths when when I got a text message asking if I was free one evening uh, to read down the Beethoven uh, septet. And I show up and I, I frankly thought it was going to be, you know, a bunch of students. And instead, I see Jose there. I see Jen Montone, principal horn of the Philadelphia Orchestra, all these Philly Orchestra colleagues. And I was scared out of my mind. I don't think I've ever played softer or more boring and safe than in, than in that reading because I so badly didn't want to rock the boat and screw things up. So where did that Billy go? That's not the Billy I can find out camera. You, you, mi do, you, 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 miss, you miss that Billy? <laughs> that, 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 that Billy feels like he has nothing left to lose. <laughs> uh, well, you know, let's listen to some music and we'll come back to this afterwards. Um, Nielsen Wind Quintet, what a lineup of musicians. You were Unbelievable. by Jose, Mark Owen, Nick Daniel, and Jasmine Choi. So tell us, you introduced the piece. Tell us about your, uh, take a few minutes, tell us about the piece, tell us about your experience with that quintet. It was, it was I thoroughly enjoyed watching you guys work together. This, this, this quintet is maybe the standard wind quintet. I mean, it's it's certainly the first quintet I ever played. I think as as a as a freshman in high school, I played the the first movement of it at a at a band camp, and I mean, it's something that that becomes so familiar at a certain point that it's like, oh yeah, the Nielsen, you know, the the thing that starts with a bassoon solo, and I don't really remember what happens after that, <laughs> but but you know, to play it with this lineup at, at Camerata, you know, it was sort of beyond revelatory to me. It went beyond, you know, sort of 
rediscovering or discovering for the first time what a fantastic piece this is. And it, it really sort of evolved over the course of our rehearsals, over the course of our performances, into frankly one of the musical highlights of my career. You know, I, I remember that the first time I revisited this this performance at the beginning of, of the quarantine, I was wrecked. Because I mean, it was the most perfect encapsulation of why I miss performing. I think you know, also, Avery, but you you were all and you were all aware the, the, and me on on the on the outside of the rehearsal process, and then when you brought it to performance, um, everybody was aware this was a special. Oh, the, the 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 first the first day that we sat down and read the first movement down, someone said, "Oh, this is clearly not going to work." Yeah. You know, just, just just embracing the absurdity of how much fun we were having, because you know the, these these people who who you bring together at, at Camerata, it, it just goes so far beyond. Okay, on the repeat, we're going to play it louder. Yeah. You know, there's 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 this spontaneity, there's this this communication, and this this interaction that I remember talking with Jose once about this. It's just sort of the purest and most satisfying approach to chamber music I, I can envision. So, you know, at this point, I've, I've probably built up this performance beyond what it could possibly live up to, but it was, it was really an incredibly special experience. It, well, it is a superb performance. You have to mention, because some people will notice, and um, uh, you, you have issues with your bassoon at the end. What is... <laughs> <laughs> this, this this clearly was was a, a pre-COVID um, performance because you didn't you didn't have any toilet paper issues to get that roll that you put it. What what? I, that, that that was the most elegant introduction to this curiosity I could have envisioned. Thank you for that, Adrian. <laughs> Classical music we're we're such a refined uh, and genteel populist. No, it's <laughs> it's, it's true. <laughs> No, it's it's true. So the, the last note of this piece is a low A, which is one note lower than the bassoon can traditionally play. And so what 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 you need to do in order to achieve this note is to stick some kind of extension into the instrument to effectively lengthen and therefore lower the pitch of the instrument. And I'll have you know that I actually spent the ten dollars on a very fancy plastic extension. I, I did not go the toilet paper route. Uh, all for you, Adrian. You know, and and I, I think it, I think it, I, I think the 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 sonorite, the tom, in the last chord, benefits because of it. It just it's your dedication to the art, Billy. It just it just vibrates, and without that ten dollars, it, it would have been a disaster. There you go. Um, so that doubled the value of your instrument, then, really. <laughs> essentially, <laughs> essentially, exactly. Um, all right. So this is from um, January 17th, 2020. Um, Jasmine Choi, Nicholas Daniel, Jose Frank Ballester, Martin Owen, and the one and only Billy Short, Nielsen Wind Quintet. Thank you. 
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And Billy, thanks for not leaving. <laughs> so that was, yeah. And the choral, the, 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 Oh, that, that that wind quintet is just fantastic. I don't like wind quintets. Uh, the, you know, it, it's the 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 calliope on steroids effect does never works for me. But there are two wind quintets I like: um, Harbison, Nielsen, Janacek. That's it. Barber. I don't just don't the barber doesn't do it for me. I don't that's that. okay. That's that. That's your right. But but I agree with you. You know, so so often I think with wind quintets, it's kind of like painting in neon colors. You know, you have five instruments that have such distinct colors and and um, and characters, which can be an incredible asset. You know, in the hands of of the right composer, but but I think very often turns into something that's just sort of so many different overdone overdone colors there 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 isn't really a sense of blend but you know nielsen especially with with players like this it works I, and i suppose i suppose we should give uh, there should be some concession to the composers that it really wasn't until the 20th century until they got five wind instruments that were properly capable of playing with each other no, I think that's that's a totally fair point, and it's it's an interesting, you know, reflection of how the sort of evolution of the instrument and the quality of the the repertoire often in music history go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. So um, before we go to the last piece we're going to play today, um, you were in Delaware, going back and forward to Texas. And was it from Delaware straight to the map? Is that what happened? Essentially, yeah. I mean, actually, the the week that I auditioned from for the Met, I was bouncing back and forth between between you know a, a performance week in Delaware and New York for for the multiple rounds of of the audition. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like the the day after I I got the job at the Met, I had one of my last concerts with my fantastic colleagues in Delaware. Yeah. So. For, for all the challenges of being a Met musician of the past 12 months, um, let's tell me, tell me about a peak experience. There must have been many of them in, in a decade there. There, there, there have been several. I, I have to say that the number one musical experience that I've, that I've had there has been the two runs I've, I've played of Parsifal. Um, and, and prior to this, this was my first Wagner opera that, that I ever played. And, and prior to, you know, actually sitting down to, to play this piece, um, all I had really heard about Parsifal was from a, an old teacher of mine at Rice who said that Parsifal was the only thing he had ever played in his life that had the same effect on him as jet lag. That, that it, it took about two or three days to recover from playing this five and a half, six hour opera. Um, but it it really sort of was a seminal experience for me in redefining what it could mean as a musician to be part of something greater than yourself mm -hmm. of of coming together and and elevating this incredible transcendent work by frankly a, a rather unpleasant at best human being uh, and and you know that's that's a, a contradiction that i that i don't quite know how to resolve but it's still hard to separate myself from just how elevating that experience was uh finding out just how beautiful how meaningful music could be and and just to sort of come back from thirty thousand feet down to the level of the pit so to speak i will say that another of my favorite experience stem experiences stemming from that first run of parsifal was at the end of act two in which um the entire stage is flooded with about two thousand gallons of fake blood in one performance we all sort of trudge out of the pit go back into the men's locker room this is you know four four and a half hours into into the evening already and somewhere they had sprung a leak upstairs because we walk into the men's locker room and there are streams of fake blood just pouring down the walls. And, and I just remember seeing that and, and taking a minute and thinking to myself, I don't think this happens at the New York Philharmonic. 
<laughs> there you go, my friend. Um, we have not yet, you know, we haven't had any uh, seriously gory experiences at Camerata Pacifica. Yeah. May that, may that stay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so another, so um, our digestif for today's concert at home is, is that very unusual piece? Um, do you do you want to take the lead in on this? No, it wasn't, Mark knew, he was a professor at Curtis, I believe, right? Briefly, I believe that's it. That's absolutely true, yeah. Yeah, and and I mean, this, this Mark knew sex said is just a fantastic piece. And it's and it's one that I did not know before uh, coming to to California to 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 do this this concert. Oh really? You didn't know this? Oh, oh it's I, a I, super piece. I I mean, and not just because it has two bassoons in it. <laughs> well, yeah. On top of that, it's a great piece. <laughs> and and I think what I what I love most about this piece is the incredible diversity and array of styles mm -hmm. that that Martin who so so skillfully navigates. You know. It, it reminds me of, of um, another highlight from, from my time at the Met, which was um, my first time playing the Strauss opera Die Frau in a Schatten, which, which runs the gamut from, you know, the most traditional, beautiful sort of Bachian chorales to the most tonality busting late romanticism and everywhere in between. And, and I feel like Martineau demonstrates sort of a similar flexibility and mastery of all these different styles you know you, you just have to look at how the different instruments are featured in this piece to to see that you know to see sort of the particular characters of the clarinet solo or this massive flute solo movement that i know is the actual reason that you programmed the piece <laughs> or or the or the bassoon the bassoon solo and i i remember i would always sit there um listening to this incredibly virtuosic flute flute solo and then come in with my with my little bassoon solo that just goes, you know, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> it's like, I see what Martin who thought the bassoon could do. <laughs> but it's just, it's just a fantastic piece. There's so much expression, there's so much variety of character. And again, to play this piece with with musicians who are willing to commit so unselfconsciously. To right. really bring that range of expression to life is just such an unbelievable treat. Yep. So, all right. This is from 2018, uh, November 7th. And the wind quintet is Benjamin Smollum, is the flute player, Nick Daniel, Jose Frank Ballester, and two bassoons, our friend Billy and Judy Farmer. And then the only person who can manage and corral the characters that are the camerata wind players, the long-suffering, ever fascinating, always wonderful Molly Markowski on piano. Because it's, it's an unusual instrumentation. So wind quintet with two bassoons um, and piano. Martin you six step. Enjoy the show. Billy, thanks very much for being here. I cannot, I can't wait to have you all. I can't wait to we're gathered together again. I, 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 those concerts, those concerts are going to be, some, <laughs> these are going to be some experiences when we, when we get back together again. I, I, I can't wait. I, I really, really can't. Yeah. Well, it's good. It's good. Good to see you looking so well. So stay safe. Likewise. Wear a mask when you're out and let's get through this. Thanks so much. Same to you, everybody. Adrian. All right. Bye, Billy. Bye.
Thank you.